current view is that the universe began with what's called the Big Bang. Immediately following that was a stage of inflation, which was a, an exponential expansion. You think 93 billion light years across is massive? Well, that's just the part of the universe we can see. That's right, there's more, potentially an infinite amount more, stretching beyond what we can currently observe. It's a mystery, but guess what? We've got the James Webb Space Telescope to help uncover these cosmic secrets. Combined with the brain power of thinkers like Roger Penrose, we're pushing the boundaries of what we know about our incredible universe. Let's dive in. The observable universe. It's pretty massive, and when we try to get a handle on its size, we usually talk about what's called the observable universe. So what's that, you ask? Well, it's basically the part of the universe that we can see from here on Earth. Think of it like this. Light travels super fast, right? Like the fastest thing we know of. But even with that speed, light takes time to get from one place to another. Now the universe is around 13.8 billion years old. So when we look at something really far away, we're actually seeing the light that left that thing a long time ago. If something's so far away that its light would have taken more than 13.8 billion years to reach us, well, we just can't see it because the universe hasn't been around long enough for that light to get to us. So our observable universe is like a big bubble around us, going out as far as light could have traveled since the universe started. Turns out that's about 46 billion light years in any direction from us. Why is it bigger than 13.8 billion light years if the universe is only 13.8 billion years old? How can it be that the universe not only was very special, but it was very special in a very special way? That is to say, it's only in that gravity was somehow not activated in the very early universe. It's because the universe has been expanding since the beginning, so things that emitted light 13.8 billion years ago are now further away. Okay. So that gives us a bubble, or a sphere, around us that's 93 billion light years across. Huge, right? And that's just the part of the universe we can see. There could be way, way more universe out there that we just can't see yet, because the light hasn't had time to get to us. Now, within our big old observable universe bubble, there's loads going on. There are at least 2 trillion galaxies, and each one of those is home to billions, or even trillions of stars, plus planets, and other objects. And it's not just about the things we can see, like stars and galaxies. There's a whole lot of stuff in the universe that we can't see directly, but we know it's there. Stuff like dark matter, which is this mysterious substance that we can't see or touch, but we know it's there because of the way galaxies move. And then there's dark energy, which is even weirder, and it's what's causing the universe to expand faster and faster. Then there's also this faint glow of radiation all throughout space, called the cosmic microwave background. It's like the afterglow from the Big Bang, the event that started the universe. And there are also things called neutrinos whizzing around, tiny particles that barely interact with anything, but we know they're there. The redshift. Since we can't pick up any signals from beyond our observable patch, we really don't know what's out there. One of the strangest things about our universe is that it's not standing still. It's like it's on a constant growth spurt, always stretching and expanding. This means everything in it, from galaxies to clusters of galaxies, is getting further and further apart. Some things that we can see now will eventually drift so far away that they'll disappear from our view. This expanding universe also messes with the signals we get from faraway sources. It stretches out the waves of light, making them longer. We call this redshift. The further away something is, the more its light is redshifted. The universe is like a grand cosmic show, and we've got front row seats. But here's the catch. We're watching everything on a delay. You look at a star 10 light years away, and you're not seeing it as it is now. You're seeing the light that left it 10 years ago, so you're seeing the star as it was back then. The further away an object is, the older the light we're seeing from it. So we can see way, way back in time, almost to the beginning of the universe, just by looking further out. That means by checking out objects at different distances, we can basically map out the entire history and evolution of the universe right from the get-go to today. The Sun and the Moon Now the Sun and the Moon may look close, but they're actually pretty far from us. Starting with the Sun, it's a whopping 150 million kilometers away from us, give or take. 
that's around 93 million miles. We call this distance one astronomical unit, or AAU for short. But it's not always the same because Earth doesn't orbit the Sun in a perfect circle. It's more of an ellipse or a slightly stretched out circle. So when Earth is closest to the Sun, which usually happens in early January, we're about 147 million kilometers, or 91 million miles away. We call this perihelion. On the flip side, when we're at our farthest point from the Sun, usually in early July, we're about 152 million kilometers, or 94 million miles away. This is called aphelion. So we're going to be at aphelion, which is the furthest point in our not-so-circular orbit around the Sun. And that takes us, you know, pretty far away. And that, you know, doesn't make a whole lot of sense in July. Now, let's talk about our Moon. The average distance between Earth and the Moon is about 384,000 kilometers, or 238,000 miles. That's 0.0026 AU. Like the Sun, the Moon's distance isn't always the same because it also orbits Earth in an ellipse. Once a month, the Moon gets closest to us at about 363,000 kilometers, or 225,000 miles. This is known as perigee. And about once a month, it's at its farthest point, around 405,000 kilometers, or 251,000 miles away, which we call apogee. To put these massive distances into perspective, let's say, hypothetically, you could travel at the speed of light. It would take you around 8 minutes to reach the Sun from Earth. For the Moon, it's a super quick 1.3 second journey. But what if you could only travel at the speed of sound? Well, that journey to the Sun would take you about 14 years, and for the Moon, you'd be looking at around 10 days, Proxima Centauri. We all know our nearest stellar neighbor is the Sun, relatively speaking, but what about the second closest? That would be Proxima Centauri, and it's part of a fascinating three-star system named Alpha Centauri. Proxima Centauri isn't like our Sun, though. It's a red dwarf star, a bit more modest and chill, you could say. But when it comes to distance, it's about 4.25 light years away from us here on Earth. Now, when we talk about a light year, we're talking about how far light travels in a year. So, when we see Proxima Centauri from our telescope, we see it as it was 4.25 years ago. There's also something super interesting about Proxima Centauri. It's got planets, at least two that we know of, and one of them might just be in the habitable zone. That's the sweet spot where conditions could allow liquid water to exist on a planet's surface. It's the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right. It gives us a sliver of hope that maybe, just maybe, we might find life out there. But let's not forget about the other two stars in the Alpha Centauri system. Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. They're more like our sun in size and brightness at least. These two celestial buddies orbit each other, and they're around 23 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun away from each other. From Earth, they're a bit farther than Proxima Centauri, around 4.37 light years away. So how far is this really? Well, let's think about it in terms of travel time. If we could move at the speed of light, we could get to Proxima Centauri in 4.25 years. But what if we could only travel at the speed of sound? Well, you'd better be prepared for a long trip, like very long. We're talking about 77,000 years to get to Proxima Centauri. The Milky Way. Zooming out, let's look at the distance and size of the Milky Way. Did you know we've never seen a real photo of the full Milky Way? What we see are artists' impressions, best guesses, or photos of other galaxies that we think look like ours. Here's why. Our galaxy is massive, about 100,000 light years across. A light year is the distance light travels in a year, which is crazy far, around 9.5 multiplied by 10 to the power 12 kilometers. So to take a selfie of our galaxy, we'd have to send a camera so far away that it would take more time than the universe has been around just to get into position. And then we'd have to wait millennia more for the photo to make its way back to us. Think about it this way. Since we invented the radio in the early 1900s, its signals have been spreading out into the universe. But even traveling at the speed of light, They've only had about 100 years to travel, so they're only about 100 light years away. Considering our galaxy is 100,000 light years across, that's not far at all, so 99.99% .99 of the stars in our galaxy haven't heard from us yet. But even though the Milky Way is huge, we can only see a tiny part of it from Earth. On a clear night, far from city lights, you might see about 3,000 stars with your bare eyes. Now let's talk more about the Milky Way. It's like a big, flat disk between 100,000 and 200,000 light-years across, and up to tens of thousands of light-years thick, 
especially towards the center. Speaking of the center, there's a bulge there, a roundish blob about 12,000 light years across. Our Sun is located about 26,000 light years away from the center, in a part of the galaxy we call the Orion Arm. Our Milky Way is chock full of stars, somewhere between 100 and 400 billion of them. And there are at least as many planets. Its heart, towards the constellation Sagittarius, is Sagittarius A star the supermassive black hole suspected to reside there. At the center of it all is an incredibly strong radio source known as Sagittarius A asterisk, which we think is a supermassive black hole with a mass of 4.1 million suns. As for other galaxies, they're not exactly next door neighbors. The closest major galaxy to ours is the Andromeda galaxy, and it's a whopping 2.5 million light years away. Other galaxies in our local group range from about 25,000 to 4.5 million light years away. The local group. Speaking of local group, turns out that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not hanging out solo. We've got company over 20 other galaxies are part of our local group. The local group stretches about 10 million light years across, so it's no small suburb. Altogether, all the stars in the local group galaxies add up to a whopping 2 trillion times the mass of our sun. Credit for realizing the local group exists goes to Edwin Hubble. He's the guy they named the Hubble Space Telescope after. Back in the day, when scientists were just figuring out how far away and fast everything in space was moving, Hubble made a crucial discovery. He realized some of the stuff we thought was part of the Milky Way was actually way farther away. They were other galaxies, like Andromeda and Triangulum. Not only did Hubble figure out they were separate galaxies, but he also found that they were moving toward each other like they were being pulled by some sort of invisible cosmic magnet. Turns out that invisible magnet was gravity. So what does the local group look like? Well, on one end, you've got the Milky Way and its bunch of satellite galaxies. On the other end, there's the Andromeda galaxy with its own collection of satellites. The distance between these two ends is about 3 million light years, and they're heading toward each other at a speed of 123 kilometer per second. Both the Milky Way and Andromeda are spiral galaxies, and they are the big shots in the local group, each one containing around one trillion times the mass of our sun. They each have their own group of mostly dwarf galaxies tagging along. After our Milky Way and Andromeda, the next heavyweight in our local group is the Triangulum Galaxy, or M33 as some people call it. This is another spiral galaxy, but it's a bit smaller, with a mass of around 50 billion times that of our sun. There's a bit of a question mark around Triangulum's relationship with Andromeda. They're not far from each other in cosmic terms, just 750,000 light years apart. And about two to four billion years ago, they had a close encounter that sparked a lot of star birth in Andromeda. But whether Triangulum is Andromeda's sidekick or just a passing acquaintance is still up for debate. The Virgo Supercluster. So we've talked about our home galaxy, the Milky Way, and its neighbors in our local group. Now let's take a few steps back and look at the bigger picture, to our neighborhood in the wider universe, the Virgo Supercluster. Think of the Virgo Supercluster as a bustling metropolis of galaxies. It's not just our local group hanging out there, but over a hundred other galaxy groups and clusters. In terms of size, it's mind-blowingly huge, about 110 million light years across. And it's heavy too, with a mass of around 1 quadrillion 480 trillion times the mass of our sun. But the Virgo supercluster isn't some lonely island in the cosmos. It's one of many, many superclusters that make up the observable universe. It's also part of a larger structure called the Pisces Cetus supercluster complex, a sort of gigantic thread of galaxies stretched out across the universe. The person who first figured out the Virgo supercluster was a thing is Gerard de Vaucouleur. Back in the 1950s, he realized there was this big group of galaxies that included our local group. He called it the local supergalaxy, and later the local supercluster. To figure this out, de Vaucouleur built on the work of Edwin Hubble. Hubble also figured out that they were heading towards each other because of gravity. De Vaucouleur took these findings and used them to identify the Virgo supercluster. So when we talk about our place in the universe, it's not just about our planet or our galaxy. We're part of the local group, which is part of the Virgo supercluster, which is part of the Pisces, Cetus supercluster complex, which is part of the whole vast universe, and that universe is full of other planets, galaxies, groups, clusters, superclusters, and complexes. 
We have established that the Virgo supercluster is this big collection of galaxies, right? But it's not just a random jumble of galaxies. No, it's got some structure to it. In the middle, you've got this flat disk. That's where most of the bright, shiny galaxies are. It's kind of stretched out along this thing called the supergalactic plane. This plane isn't a physical thing. It's an imaginary line that astronomers use to map out where the galaxies in the supercluster are. Then, around is the halo of the supercluster, and it's more or less spherical. It contains all the other galaxies that aren't in the disk. At the heart of the supercluster, close to the center of that disk, is the Virgo cluster. This cluster is the biggest and heaviest member of the supercluster, weighing in at around one quadrillion times the mass of our sun and home to over 1,300 galaxies. Our local group is like a house on the outskirts of this galactic city, located on a small string of galaxies that stretches from the fornacular cluster to the Virgo cluster. So why is the Virgo supercluster such a big deal for astronomers? Well, it gives them a window into a bunch of different things. They can use it to study how galaxies come into being, change over time, interact with each other, and are shaped by their surroundings. The supercluster also offers hints about the wider structure of the universe, how it's expanding, and the mysterious stuff we call dark matter and dark energy. In fact, astronomers have noticed that the Virgo supercluster is slowly moving towards an area of space called the Great Attractor. This is a spot where gravity seems to be way stronger than normal, and it's pulling in the Virgo supercluster and a bunch of other nearby superclusters. On top of all that, a study in 2014 suggested that the Virgo supercluster isn't a standalone structure. Instead, it's part of a bigger supercluster, called Laniakea. That's a Hawaiian word, and it translates to immense heaven. Laniakea supercluster. Laniakea supercluster is the home turf of our Milky Way and about 100,000 other nearby galaxies. To give you an idea of the scale, Laniakea stretches about 520 million light years across. In terms of mass, it's a mind-boggling 100 quadrillion times the mass of our Sun. Just like the Virgo supercluster, Laniakea is part of a bigger structure known as the Pisces Cetus supercluster complex. This is a massive thread of galaxies that weaves through the universe. But Laniakea is just one of many, many superclusters in the universe that we can see. The Laniakea supercluster is actually a pretty recent addition to our cosmic map. In September 2014, a team of astronomers came up with a new way to define superclusters. They did this by looking at how galaxies move relative to each other. The key to this approach was something called peculiar motion. It's a measure of a galaxy's total movement, but with the part caused by the universe's expansion taken out. From there, the astronomers could map out the paths galaxies are taking, their flow lines, and figure out where the gravitational center pulling them in is. These gravitational centers are like the engines that drive superclusters. They pull galaxies towards them, shaping the structure of the supercluster. So, by mapping these flow lines and gravitational centers, astronomers were able to define the Laniakea supercluster and figure out its borders. Now let's zoom in a little on Laniakea. This supercluster isn't one big homogeneous block. It's actually made up of four smaller parts. These used to be known as their own separate superclusters, Virgo, Hydra Centaurus, Pavo Indus, and Southern. So, where's the heart of Laniakea? It's right near this thing called the Great Attractor. That's a place in space that has a really strong gravitational pull, so strong that it's dragging in lots of nearby superclusters. It's a bit like a cosmic whirlpool, drawing everything around it in. Our local group, where the Milky Way hangs out, isn't right in the center of all this action. We're more on the fringes of Laniakea, in a thin line of galaxies that goes from the Fornax Cluster to the Virgo Supercluster. And like the Virgo Supercluster, Laniakea gives astronomers some important clues about the bigger picture of the universe, including its structure and how it's expanding. It can also help them learn more about dark matter and dark energy, two of the biggest mysteries in modern astronomy. Interestingly, Laniakea itself seems to be on the move. Astronomers have found that it's moving towards a region of space known as the Shapley Concentration. This is another massive supercluster that might be part of a larger structure called the Shapley Supercluster Complex. The Observations Now, after all this talk about the universe's structure, you might be wondering how we get all this knowledge. Well, much of what we know comes from some pretty impressive space observatories, like the Hubble Space Telescope and the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. First, let's chat about the Hubble Space Telescope. 
Hubble's been out there in space since 1990, taking amazing photos and gathering loads of data. The telescope can pick up visible light, ultraviolet light, and near-infrared light, making it a super versatile tool for astronomers. Hubble orbits about 547 kilometers above Earth, and its main mirror is a whopping 2.4 meters across. And it's made some pretty groundbreaking discoveries about galaxies and how they evolve. Take, for example, the Hubble Deep Field. This is a picture Hubble took in 1995 showing about 1,500 galaxies. And get this, some of those galaxies had formed just 800 million years after the Big Bang. But Hubble didn't stop there. In 2004, it took another photo, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which revealed about 10,000 galaxies. Some of them had formed as early as 400 million years after the Big Bang. And then, in 2012, it went even further with the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, capturing about 5,500 galaxies that were around just 300 million years after the Big Bang. Finally, between 2013 and 2017, Hubble took a series of shots known as the Frontier Fields, focusing on six galaxy clusters. These images revealed galaxies that were up and running a mere 200 million years after the Big Bang. All these photos have really shaken up what we thought we knew about the universe. They've shown us that galaxies were forming much earlier and on a larger scale than we'd ever imagined. Plus, they've shown us a breathtaking diversity of galaxies, each in different stages of their lifetimes. Now, while Hubble has been doing its thing, we've had another eye in the sky, the James Webb Space Telescope. This beast of a telescope, launched in 2021, focuses on infrared light. It can detect near-infrared, mid-infrared, and even far-infrared light. Now, Webb is no small fry. It boasts a primary mirror that's 6.5 meters across, more than twice the size of Hubble's. Plus, it's a whole lot further from Earth, at a distance of around 1.5 million kilometers, at the second Lagrange point. This is a specific point in space where the gravitational pull of the Earth and the Sun balance out. Even though it's still early days for Webb, it's already made some mind-boggling discoveries. Webb is going to be the largest space telescope that we've ever flown to conduct uh, astrophysical studies. That's, that's quite simply the bottom line. Uh, it's got a six and a half meter um, aperture telescope. For starters, it spotted galaxies that came into being just 150 million years after the Big Bang. These are the most distant and ancient galaxies we've ever seen. It's also detected water vapor, both on an ultra-hot exoplanet and around a comet in our own asteroid belt. This shows us that water is found in all sorts of places in our solar system and beyond. It's also shown us a large plume shooting out from Saturn's moon Enceladus, hinting that it might have a subsurface ocean that could support life. Not to mention, it's even caught sight of Wolf Rayet star ripples, which are shockwaves made by massive stars ejecting stuff at high speeds, and a brown dwarf with clouds made of iron and silicate dust. Methods of Observation Now, both Hubble and Webb have been critical in helping us figure out the size of the universe. They've used methods like parallax, which involves measuring how an object's position appears to shift when viewed from different points in Earth's orbit. This is great for sizing up objects in our galaxy. Then there's the use of standard candles and the phenomenon of cosmological redshift. Standard candles are objects, like supernovae or variable stars, whose intrinsic brightness we know. By comparing how bright they appear to us with how bright they really are, we can figure out how far away they are. Cosmological redshift, on the other hand, happens when the light from distant objects gets stretched or redshifted to longer wavelengths because of the expanding universe. If we measure how much an object's spectrum is redshifted, we can use Hubble's law to estimate how far away it is. These methods are super handy for estimating the distance to objects that are even further away, outside our galaxy. By using these methods, astronomers reckon that the observable universe has a diameter of about 93 billion light-years. The Expansion With all these observations, there is another very intriguing phenomenon called Conformal Cyclic Cosmology, or CCC for short. This idea is the brainchild of Roger Penrose, a renowned theoretical physicist. CCC is a kind of cosmic groundhog day. It says that the universe goes through endless cycles. Each cycle starts with a Big Bang, then expands forever, and the very end of one cycle becomes the beginning of the next. This future, remember the Escher picture, can be stretched, squashed down, and now it becomes the Big Bang of the next eon. 
And so this is what I call conformal cyclic cosmology. Now, how exactly does this work? Well, the fundamental building blocks of CCC are based on a certain model of the universe called the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric. Let's stick to FLRW for simplicity. In this model, each phase or eon, as Penrose calls them, starts with a big bang and then expands infinitely. What Penrose realized is that you can stick together the end of one eon to the beginning of the next one. Imagine squashing down the end of one eon so much that it can neatly attach to the start of a new one. That's done using something called conformal rescaling. But for this to work, the universe needs to be in a very specific state by the end of each eon. Basically, every particle that has mass needs to disappear, which includes protons and electrons. This may seem a little wild, and indeed there are some speculations in physics that allow for things like proton decay. However, we've never actually observed this happen, and the idea that electrons could also decay or lose their charge or mass is even more speculative. So the, the model I'm putting forward, a crazy model, but nevertheless, it seems to make a lot of sense. That you stretch out the Big Bang, and then it becomes the continuation of the remote future of a previous eon. Now, what's cool about this concept is what it implies for the two major types of particles in the universe, bosons and fermions. Bosons, such as photons, the particles of light, are governed by the rules of conformally invariant quantum theory. That's a fancy way of saying they behave the same way no matter how much you squash or stretch the universe. This means that for bosons, moving from one eon to the next is as simple as crossing from one side of a room to the other. Fermions, on the other hand, which include things like electrons, don't get to make the journey. They stay put in their own eon. According to Penrose, this offers a possible solution to a long-standing puzzle in physics known as the black hole information paradox. In essence, fermions get converted into radiation, which is made up of bosons, when they fall into black holes, ensuring a smooth transition between eons. Based on what we currently observe and understand about our universe, it appears to be flat and it's predominantly filled with the mysterious thing we call dark energy. Dark energy seems to be pushing the universe to expand faster and faster. This suggests that our universe is infinite and will keep on expanding. So in the grand cycle of CCC, we're somewhere in the middle of an eon, hurtling towards an infinite future where our universe expands forever, only to set the stage for the next cosmic cycle to begin. Proof of Conformal Cyclic Cosmology Right, so this conformal cyclic cosmology we were talking about comes with some predictions we should be able to test. In particular, it suggests that the cosmic microwave background, or CMB, might hold the secrets of previous cycles. The CMB is like the afterglow of the universe's birth, a snapshot from when the universe was just a baby. Now, if CCC is correct, we might find evidence in the CMB of stuff that happened in the previous cosmic cycle. For example, if massive black holes from the last cycle crashed into each other, they would have sent ripples through space-time in the form of gravitational waves. This could show up as circles of temperature differences in the CMB. These are the kind of clues we should be looking for. This is where the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, could prove invaluable. It has the ability to observe the CMB in incredible detail, not only could it spot the predicted temperature circles, but it could also look for other oddities in how galaxies or quasars are spread around the universe that could suggest CCC is on the right track. On top of that, the JWST could help us out with a bit of a puzzle we're currently facing in cosmology, which involves figuring out the size and expansion rate of the universe. This involves something called the Hubble constant, and right now we're getting conflicting results depending on how we measure it. So. JWST could help us iron out this discrepancy by offering us more precise measurements of the Hubble constant using different methods. One way it could do this is by observing standard candles. These are objects like certain types of stars, supernovae, or quasars, whose true brightness we know. By looking at how bright they appear to us and comparing that to how bright they actually are, we can work out their distance. The beauty of using JWST for this is that it observes in infrared light which isn't as badly affected by dust in space as visible light. JWST could also use gravitational lensing to help measure distances. This is when the light from far-off objects gets bent on its journey to us because it passes near a massive object, like a galaxy. This can cause distortions and multiple images of the same distant object. 
JWST could use these distortions to calculate distances, which could help us get a better grip on the Hubble constant. Finally, JWST could also use cosmic chronometers to measure the universe's expansion. These are objects, like old stars or galaxies, whose ages we can determine by looking at their light. By comparing their redshift and their age, we can estimate the Hubble constant. Again, JWST's ability to observe in infrared is key here, as it provides more sensitive information about an object's age. So in a nutshell, JWST could really help us to refine our understanding of the size and growth of the universe. And who knows, it might even give us a glimpse into the history of past cosmic cycles. Do you think the universe is infinite? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Stay tuned for more mind-bending videos.